to Ann Arbor, Michigan in this moment. Which is to say that Callie House was enslaved in her infancy, born into slavery, raised as a child in slavery in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Move this down. How's that? She was born into slavery, uh, raised in her infancy in servitude in the state of Tennessee. She grew up, became a washerwoman, a laundress, not unlike Rosa Parks. Callie House subsequently married, had five children, had six children, five lived to adulthood. But Callie House, looking over the landscape of the South, littered with the bodies, the being, the diminished dignity of black people. She, not being a, a graduate of Michigan Policy School or the law school, uh, not being a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School or the law school, this formerly untutored, formerly uneducated, laundress, washer woman, conceives of a repertory scheme for justice, which is to say Callie House partnered with others to create the first grass movement, grassroots movement for reparations in this nation's history, numbering at least 400,000 dues-paying members all across the South. This is well before the NAACP, well before the Urban League, well before the AFL-CIO, well before the ADL, well before the women's movement. This woman creates a grassroots movement for reparations. Why is this important? It's important because reparations is not merely about the map of compensating disgrace and diminished dignity. It is also about the flesh and blood reality of those who survived slavery. So we have Kelly House creates this organization, the National Ex-Slave Mutual Benefit Pension and Relief Association, with chapters all across the South. Callie House conceives of a uh, repertory justice framework in which she conceives of reparations based upon the Civil War pension system, which is to say she saw the one out of every five black people then living around the turn of the last century as being not unlike Union soldiers, not unlike Confederate soldiers, which is to say they were compensated for the length of their service and the degree to which their abilities were diminished. That is to say being wounded or shot or harmed. And she thought that those who were lynched, those who were beaten, those who were raped should be compensated in a morally and fiscally similar way. So this Callie House conceives of this scheme for reparations. This is critically important because today's debate, today's discourse is rooted in that reality. Not only that, Callie House, this same woman, Callie House brings the first federal lawsuit for reparations. Right, again, let us remind you, she went to graduate of the University of Michigan Law School. She brings the first suit for reparations, and the court says, essentially, we don't have jurisdiction. I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna slip this in. This is just a parenthetical, this is a footnote. You don't need to write this down, but it's just too good not to be noted. Right, so Callie House, her, her theory of the case was that taxes were collected on cotton harvested by enslaved people. And that these dollars were sent to Washington, they were unallocated. So, so in terms of her fiscal and moral imagination, she imagined that these dollars were in the basement of the US Treasury, waiting to be allocated. And she thought that you could go to court and essentially say if cotton was harvested by those who were enslaved, uncompensated, that this money can be used to fund reparations. Somebody needs to put their hands together for the legal and moral imagination uh, in, in that case. Right? Come on. <laughs> so Kelly House files this lawsuit. And again, because we want to ground this talk in the reality of, of, of our forebears, we want to take note of the fact that this is historical. 
was not supported by Booker T. Washington. Not, not supported by W.E.B. Ford's uh, uh, that distinguished graduate of, of Harvard with a PhD in sociology. Not supported by the men. Let's, uh, that just a parenthetical. You don't need to write that down. Uh, Kelly House wasn't supported by that. But oddly enough, perversely enough, ironically enough, a senator by the name of Edmund Pettus, that name may seem familiar, unsettlingly familiar. You call Edmund Pettus when John Lewis, John Lewis and Amelia Boynton attempted to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. That same segregationist Edmund Pettus supported reparations back then. Why? Because he assumed that if black people in the South get anything, certainly white people will get something. Now, why do we begin with, with, with this modest story? We begin with the story because in the present debate and discourse on reparations, we essentially face three impossibilities that I'll talk about. They're addressed in a paper uh, written by my colleague Linda Vilmas and I uh, that will be uh, uh, published next June 10th. And this research uh, that animates this paper and that serves as the basis of this talk is grounded in County House's story, uh, but also grounded in law and policy and, and, and the fiscal realities of the federal government uh, today. So we want to just start with this threefold argument against reparations, what I call three impossibilities. All across the country, when people talk about reparations, even now, this many years after County House brought a federal lawsuit, this many years after County House conceived of a way of having reparations as a response, let me note here, to the desperate poverty of those who were enslaved back then and would survive slavery back then. Because let me, let me just note again, this is parenthetical, you don't need to write this down. Uh, uh, the end of slavery was the largest homelessness event in American history. So in other words, when 3.9 million, 4 million people are free via the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment, they are suddenly homeless, without home, people living in fields, sleeping out in the open, unprotected by the elements. These folks were desperately poor. So reparations, let's be clear here, was not uh, a response to some trivial racial injustice, but it was a response to real and desperate and ragged poverty. Right? All right. So here we are this many years later, facing three impossibilities. The first of which is that reparations are said to be impossible because it would be impossible with the slavery was so long ago. I think, again, I can, I can I, I said that this temporal impossibility is it, not really clear. Let me, may I make this clear? Right? So, no less a figure than Senator Mitch McConnell, who said quite bluntly, why should we have reparations for something that happened 150 years ago? So, in other words, it is assumed that slavery having happened so long ago. Uh, is impossible to address. There's a kind of temporal impossibility, right? You hear this not merely from those in Washington, but even among uh, people who might be beneficiaries of reparations, right? So even you know black and brown people say, you know, that happened a long time ago. It's regrettable, uh, but there's nothing we can do about that. Okay? Uh, secondly, reparations as a whole of some some subset of 41 million Americans. African Americans is presumed to be too difficult. It's administratively impossible. How do we do reparations for African Americans when they come in so many different colors and so many different backgrounds? Uh, how is that possible? It, it, it's, it's, too, it's too cumbersome, it's too difficult. Uh, we can't possibly do that. This is an administrative impossibility. Thirdly, uh, Reparations for black Americans and the presumably incalculable harm suffered by them is prohibitively expensive. Now, this is the moment in the, in the talk in which the fiscal conservatives grab holes of their wallets. Right? Yeah, we start talking about money. Right? Okay, they, 
I, don't, I, I only know how to do these talks in the cafe anyway. So I, you know, if, 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 if you hear something interesting, let me know. Okay? So you know, the fiscal conservatives, when we talk about reparations, when we talk about the magnitude and the heterogeneity of the harms, right? The, just the, the, the astounding diversity of these harms and the depth of these harms. It's just assumed to be prohibitively expensive. Okay. Uh, I know the students may not have yet begun to pay taxes, but for those of you who have begun to pay taxes, this is a statement plan. Okay? And as a consequence of these three possibilities, it is often stated or assumed and accepted. And the thesis of this paper is that reparations is in fact regular and routine. Okay? May I say that again? Uh, reparations, when we talk about the black people, literally it's assumed to be aberrational and exceptional. This is unusual. It would take, it's something akin to an act of God, like a hurricane or a tornado or a biblical flood of pestilence, that we can actually do anything about these uh, incalculable harms. But I would suggest to you, our research suggests that reparations is actually stunningly, astoundingly regular in the future. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. All right. So to address this matter of the impossibilities of reparations. In our research, we never to do two things. We created what we call a taxonomy of harms and a, an audit, if you will, of responses to harms. By tax, taxonomy of harms, we merely need a classification of harms. Right? You remember in, in high school biology, you, you had taxonomies dividing plants and animals, right? When it comes to racial harms, we can do something akin to that. That we can divide these harms, but I want to go beyond that. Right, your history books I often allocate the harms. They're housing harms, they're employment harms, they're political harms when it comes to uh, <laughs> black people. But these harms have been inflicted due to federal policy. Yes, uh, actions, inaction, negligence, and indirect effects. We want to make a case here that these harms are not limited to chattel slavery. And that these harms, I want to note this here, are intertwined. What we mean by that is quite often when we talk about the harms that black people have suffered, we often talk about them separately. We talk about lynching and housing discrimination. We talk about uh, redlining and apprenticeships. But we talk about these harms as separate, and we want to make the case here that the harms are not only uh, direct and indirect, but they're intertwined. But not only are they intertwined, but we want to make the case here that these harms compound over time. Right? Now, this is critically important because when we talk about addressing the harms, we can underestimate them if we don't at the ways in which they interact. And not only are we likely to underestimate the harms in terms of the way they interact, but we're also likely to misdiagnose, underdiagnose the potential solutions and responses to those harms. Because, for example, here, uh, if um, you have a person who has uh, cardiac arrest, the person who has cardiac arrest may uh, perspire. They may clutch their heart. They may have some difficulty breathing. Now, if you, if you attempt to address the fact that they are first firing with deodorant, <laughs> might not actually do anything to the heart. Uh, when it comes to racial justice, this is what we do sometimes. We attempt to address a particular harm, but not another harm, and we don't look at the ways they interact. Hey, wait, wait there. I, I just want to make sure that this is really coming together, right? So uh, these harms are uh, intergenerational, they compound, they're intersectional. Um, over time. In this paper, we look at these harms illustratively, not exhaustively, and we look at housing, wages, employment, labor markets, criminal justice, healthcare, education, 
uh, the franchise, the vote, and violence. Okay? Uh, these horns represent uh, horns to black American bodies, opportunities, and wealth. And we, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus on housing, education, and wages, um, and employment, and labor markets. Okay? Against this uh, presumed impossibility of harms, uh, as a possibility, we want to juxtapose them to what we call a long standing norm in government. And this is where it gets interesting. I, I know sometimes when we talk about the federal government, it can be boring, but I, this is where I need to get excited. All right? In government, there is a norm, a, 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 a kind of moral expectation that when a, someone suffers a harm through no fault of their own, the government will often compensate them, right? This is almost like a moral ethical <coughs> axiom applied to fiscal policy. Okay, let me, let me, let me show you why this is important. Now let's say, uh, what's your name? Rachel. Rachel, okay. Let's say Rachel has this absolutely astounding house, perched on a cliff in a hurricane zone, right? Now, but Rachel, smart person that she is, has the house fully insured. So when the hurricane comes along predictably year after year, takes out her home, she's compensated. She's subsidized. Her community can receive economic assistance. Uh, her business can receive favorable loans. She's been harmed through no fault of her own, but this axiom, this principle, this norm operates to her advantage. If, um, you're near, Peter, if Peter is an industrious farmer, he raises a wonderful crop of whatever every year, right? Probably not too good for the American diet, but let's say a wonderful crop, okay? Uh, he experiences a crop failure, right? The U.S. Department of Agriculture has all manner of pro uh, programs to assist him uh, in the way of a crop failure based upon this norm, right? Now we then argue in our paper that this norm is represented in what we call repertory compensation. Okay? Now this is critically important because if we are to uh, understand reparations in the broader context of ways in which it helps many Americans, although we don't call it reparations, we have, to un we have to appreciate the undergirding norm and look at the ways in which it's applied, look at the beneficiaries, look at the context, so that we might draw analogies to the racial harms which are compounded, intertwined, interconnected over generations that represent a loss of intergener intergenerational wealth and represent the racial wealth gap. Okay? Critically important. This uh, taxonomy of harms suggests, and this a no, norm of repertory compensation, I want you to hear this, suggests that the government actually has the resources, the administrative and programmatic and moral imagination, and the experience to address a whole range of racial harms. This is critically important. Why? Because when advocates, and I'm not just talking about this, the, the sophisticates in this room, right? So you all are doing the sophisticates. But what about the people um, who never set foot on to the University of Michigan? What about the folks who are not fellows uh, in, in, in the program we just described, who are dealing with this whole issue of reparations at the local and the municipal level, uh, who are unaware that there's all kinds of programmatic and fiscal and moral precedent elsewhere in government? Right? So they're analytically unequipped, ill-equipped, ill-prepared to deal with the arguments that defeat them day in and day out. Right? So this norm of repertory compensation resembles um, religious and human rights norms. Right? So in other words, if you look at the uh, people of the book of the Abrahamic tradition, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, also Hinduism, uh, also philosophers like John Locke, uh, all of them had these strands of reparations built in. So, so when people say reparations is, is something the radical young people do, right? Well, some of those radical young people as old as the Bible. <laughs> okay. 
philosophical uh, and moral and theological tradition you stand in. So in addition to that, uh, we, we know, of course, the United Nations through various conventions uh, has formed categories of reparation, restitution, making people whole, compensation, how to use the money, rehabilitation, putting people back into the same place, satisfaction, again, restoring them, guarantees of non-repetition, right? In other words, uh, in terms of reparation, it's not merely about me healing the wound I inflicted on you, and it's also you having the assurance I won't be wounded. <coughs> So this whole issue of reparations is not merely about money. Money is the means by which we can have a deeper discourse in terms of reconciliation and healing, but money is important. Okay? And so uh, the implementation of this norm of reparatory compensation through government programs uh, makes it clear that reparations is regular and routine. So now let's talk about uh, harms. Um, in terms of harms, we, we talk about uh, emancipation is a homelessness event, if you will. Right? And we, we recall, of course, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, government supported, government aided, government uh, white vigilantes burning, looting, destroying uh, whole neighborhoods, Black Wall Street, back in 1921. We, of course, have all seen uh, three elderly black uh, people, black women, who survived uh, Tulsa, going to the House of Representatives, going to Congress, seeking reparations 100 years later, right? Um, and this, of course, was a housing event, a homelessness event. But not only that, look at the picture on the right. Who is that? Who is that? Martin Luther King. So here's Martin Luther King, uh, right after having been assaulted with a brick uh, in Chicago in a demonstration against housing discrimination. And you recall, of course, how was the Fair Housing Act passed? Hmm? When was it passed? It passed in 1968. But it was passed literally in the wake of Dr. King's assassination as the cities across America were going up in flames. Right? These were housing harms, housing harms in terms of Jim Crow uh, discrimination, but also housing harms in, in terms of uh, redlining, housing harms in terms of rental and sales discrimination, but housing harms also related to violence, right? The ways in which we talk about housing uh, in, in, in which we don't acknowledge the relationship between violence and housing. Again, I, I can tell it's not quite clear. Ida B. Wells. Who knows her? Don't talk. I'm, I'm, I'm just ignoring you. Ida B. Wells. Who was she? Just, uh, just she a was a journalist. Guy. She studied lynching mm -hmm. throughout the country. That's right. She made it real um, internationally mm -hmm. so that people didn't hide it under the rug. That's right. And um, she won all the prizes for it. That's right. So Ida B. Wells. Oh, this, this is so good. <laughs> Look, if y'all are not excited, you need to be, right? <laughs> so I be Wells, right? Uh, du Bois was a sociologist, but I didn't be Wells with the red record, right? She did the analysis of a lynching, right? And why people were lynched, why black men were lynched. But for her efforts, her newspaper was destroyed, right? Not only that, uh, buildings all across the city of Memphis were destroyed. And not only that, uh, two of her friends uh, were murdered. Not only that, people were literally beaten and brutalized and assaulted all across the city of Memphis. Now why is this important? It's important because this racial violence in response to her emancipatory efforts led to homelessness and economic dislocation. In other words, the people of Memphis literally got up and left in mass, right? So housing is related to violence. So when we talk about how to compensate these harms, it requires a kind of historical and economic nuance, right? We can't just carve up the black experience like, like pieces of pie or cake, but we have to look at the ways in which they relate so that we understand how do we compensate 
and what do we do to compensate as well as how much? Right? So housing markets. Housing related to wages, employment, and labor markets. I, I, I'm just recapping a history, but um, uh, we, we know, of course, about employment discrimination. All of the studies show the ways in which people are discriminated against based upon um, uh, presumed to be African American sounding names. We, we know uh, the discrimination that people face with criminal records. The fact that a white man without, this is a white man with a criminal record, has less of a chance of getting certain kinds of jobs and then a black man without a criminal record, right? And that black men with criminal records, of course, face severe discrimination. But this goes back even farther than that. We know that after slavery was uh, abolished, that black children were apprenticed. Now this is, for those of you, anybody here looking to get an internship, this, this, is, this, this would be unsettling, right? If you've ever put together a resume, this would be unsettling. Right? Why? Because you list your apprenticeships, you list your internships. But back in the 1800s, this is not quite what they had in mind. Right? In other words, black children could be apprenticed to their former slave masters if their parents were deemed to be unfit, their parents were deemed to be unemployed, their parents were deemed to be beyond the jurisdiction, beyond the control of their white slave masters. So they can limitate the children. So this apprenticeship system didn't really last uh, until the 1800s. It extended well into the 1900s until we mechanized farming. Okay? So this is a form of slavery involving young people. Now, of course, this, this is a kind of labor market uh, brutality in terms of children taking their uncompensated labor. But now let's look at what happened with the adults. Right, and we, we know about the kind of generic racial discrimination in terms of wages and promotion and that kind of thing. But let's think about the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt, right? Um, uh, literally re-engineering American society. Um, but let's think about who was left out in terms of Social Security. Agricultural workers and domestic workers, which coincidentally happened to be where most black people work at that time. So at the point in which we had the social benefits that literally elevated the economic trajectory of the American economy and uh, the American uh, populace, black people are uh, conspicuously left out. So these black agricultural workers, so what was done to the children by force and by violence and subterfuge is done to the adults by legislation. Okay? And this has profound economic consequences over generations, right? So again, we're looking at the ways in which these harms interact. Again, this, what this means is that this reparation can't be left to the, to, the, to the economists. This is also in the purview of the historians. I would even go so far as to say, again, this is, a, this is an untested proposition, uh, those who are concerned about ethics and theology. Right? Right? So this, 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 it's interesting. Harms related to education. Now, here we have Joseph uh, uh, Maddox, okay? who was a vet, turning from World War II to my home state of South Carolina. First day on the bus back home, he gets into a dispute with a bus driver and he is blinded. This, of course, leads to uh, the desegregation of the military but it also underscores the ways in which GI vets were treated uh, and makes an argument for operation. That's somebody calling in the percussion. <laughs> you know, when they tell you to silence your phone, generally speaking, the, the speaker does that. Okay. So here we have, so uh, Mr. Mattis and his generation well, literally systematically excluded from the GI Bill, right? GI Bill extends unemployment benefits, it extends housing benefits, it extends employment benefits to, and educational benefits to veterans all across the country. It literally lifts and creates the modern uh, middle class all across America. It builds the American suburbs, if you will, right? Black vets 
or excluded. Mm -hmm. Please, and why so, right? So in terms of um, education, where black vets are limited in terms of where they can use their uh, GI benefits to HBC, uh, historically black colleges and universities. So why is, that a, why is that a problem? Well, if you use your GI benefits at the University of Michigan, the University of Michigan, they are professional schools, law schools, schools of engineering, schools of policy, you can enter into the professions. Many of the HBCBUs, the black colleges and universities across the South, did not have schools of engineering, did not have popular talk. <laughs> So that's barrier one. Barrier two related to distance. In other words, if you lived in the north, I should say, did not live near an HBCU, uh, you were less able to use your benefits. But even institutions like Harvard, Harvard prevented um, Sergeant Isaac Wooden from using his benefits there, even though he was admitted to a graduate program, because they didn't want to create the precedent of black vets using their benefits to go to Harvard University. So there's discrimination in the North, discrimination in the South, discrimination within HCBUs, and discrimination in terms of capacity. In other words, the black colleges and universities can only take so many vets, right? So this has profound implications in terms of education, but it also relates to housing. Why? Because if black vets were prevented from using their benefits because their benefits had to be used and implemented at the state level. So in other words, segregationist governments, local government uh, and local banks with discriminatory policies and zoning and essentially uh, uh, restrictive loans prevented black vets from using their benefits to buy housing meant that the GI Bill had zero effect in terms of the income of black vets which of course has everything to do with the housing uh, as, a, as a generator, a prime driver for intergenerational wealth to this very day. Okay. Now, how does that relate to repertory compensation? Very quickly. So if we look at, in this country, uh, people who harvest fish, fishermen. If there is a flood or some a means by which they're able to harvest, unable to harvest fish, they're compensated. Uh, when there are floods, natural disasters, when there's a trade agreement which has an impact on a community, literally communities receive economic assistance, loans, scholarships, um, job assistance, right? Um, Christmas tree farms, okay? I, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm, I'll just pick on Christians. For those of you who are not, this is an example. Christmas trees are subsidized, right? You don't have reparations, but if I'm selling Christmas trees and there's a crop failure, uh, some kind of pestilence, uh, some bug or something that destroys my crops, you receive the government, the government subsidy. Right? Anybody know that? Okay. All right. Let's see. These are just some of the great great many programs um, in which people receive compensation if they suffer some harm through no fault of their own. So let's get, I'm gonna give you a good example. This is, this is one, that if this does not elevate your blood pressure, you really need to check to see whether or not you're awake or alive, right? Here we have the Marshall Islands, in which our government dropped nuclear bombs from the sky, destroying the environment, destroying communities, impacting lives in terms of illness and sickness. And yet, many years later, our government extended an apology. We provided economic assistance. We provided compensation to those who suffered directly, but also indirectly. And somebody in the back row, you need to write this down. You know when people talk about reparations and like, how do we sort this out? Who's eligible? Well, when it comes to disasters like this, is something called presumed eligibility, which means if you live near the harm, 
you were alive doing the harm, you were presumed to be harmed. And as such, presumed to be eligible for compensation. Somebody in the back row needs to be, this is upsetting, right? Why? Because if our government could apologize, provide a holistic, comprehensive, ecological compensation to people who were bombed by the government in the Marshall Islands, what about Tulsa? Those women live, live to be a hundred. You know, one, one of the women, and I'm glad you were the name, just wrote a wonderful new book. She's still uncompensated. But now the folks in the Marshall Islands deserve compensation, most certainly, but isn't there an analogy here? Aren't these harms somewhat similar? I mean, that now, God forbid, none of us would want a nuclear bomb to drop on the top of the University of Michigan. Certainly not, but if we drop a conventional bomb, wouldn't you want compensation? Or are the folks in Tulsa are suffering from a conventional bomb? Those bombs, of course, destroyed the entire neighborhoods by Wall Street, but they've not been compensated. Okay. Uh, you, U.S. nuclear testing in the Western States in 1945, 1962, not just in North Islands in the Western States, uh, there were hearings, uh, compensation in 1990, an apology to 40,000 uh, people, $3.5 billion, in terms of the trucks, broader compensation in 2000, 60,000 people in time, 600,000 people in time. Anybody see any analysis here? Anybody sense a sense of possibility? In other words, it's, if it's fiscally possible, if it's morally imaginable, if it's programmatically possible, why are we doing it? Okay. All right. Uh, after three decades, the Nevada site of the nuclear test, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, had a, uh, hearings that included all evidence suggesting the radiation was having harmful effects you know, on the sheep or the people uh, was not only disregarded but suppressed. So we acknowledge that the ways in which we suppress what is it we in fact knew, okay? We talked about the Marshall Islands. Again, uh, all of these uh, programs responding to this. Now, here's where it gets good. I know you didn't expect for us to talk about Civil War debts and investment banking, right? Did you expect that? Oh, let's, let's think about this. Uh, so for uh, Civil War debts, we have uh, pensions. Right? It's a form of deferred compensation, right? Harriet okay. uh, uh, Tubman, you, you, you call her, right? Harriet <coughs> Tubman, Moses of her people. Harriet Tubman, first woman who led uh, troops in the war, in the Civil War, in the Low Country, South Carolina. You know she led, she freed 700 people, excuse me, 70 people on the Underground Railroad. But did you know she freed 700 people with Union soldiers? She had to fight for uh, 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 a, a pension, right? All right. But there's something called, as you know, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Now here's where we come to investment bankers. I know I can tell you you're really interested in this. When uh, we have Lehman Brothers, right? This is wonderful. Investment bank, uh, in the wake of the credit crisis, in the wake of the foreclosure crisis, when Lehman Brothers went belly up, when they went out of business, those pensions were guaranteed and secured and protected by the federal government. So the question for us is, if it's good for investment bankers, could it be good for anybody else? Posing the question, right? That was a rhetorical question, but I hope, hopefully one of you had an answer, all right? All right, Native Americans, I'm, I'm hasty for the end here. Um, we, we, we were, we were, of course, well aware of the genocide of assault, uh, massive uh, dislocation of Native Americans, including uh, the land upon which we uh, stand. Uh, and we're looking at the ways in which our government, not enough, at least categorically and conceptually, suggesting it's possible, um, has provided some form of reparatory compensation going back generations. So this whole notion that we can't deal with reparations for black people, if it involves multiple generations, there are actually examples uh, in government to suggest that we can do this, all right? Um, all right, I'm gonna hasten to some conclusions. Um, we're calling for a uh, national commission on reparations okay? uh, to develop a reparations program to address a full range of racial harms. We're also calling for, uh, this is quite a uh, congestion and straightforward uh, listening sentence and providing the public with data. In other words, what would happen if the federal government 
did an analysis, repertory compensation, and gave the data to the people. Right? So in other words, let's not have a debate about whether or not reparations is an aberration or exception when it comes to black people. Look, let's talk about the ways in which reparations are done every day. Let's have people talk about, well, are Christmas trees equivalent to uh, people who are 100 years old and who were bombed by, by, by state government in Oklahoma? Are these things are not obvious. Public university, right? What would happen if we had public hearings to provide the people with uh, data? Uh, what would happen if we had an audit of federal repertory compensation programs detailing their budgets, the beneficiaries, and legal authorities, and the ways in which our government is already responding to a multitude of harms? Right? What would happen? Uh, an audit of all federal regulatory compensation programs since 1865, a review of the World War II and Korean War uh, black vets, their sources, collecting their narrative, right? Um, creating a taxonomy and a, and a study of racial harms, issuing a national repertory compensation report uh, as, as an evidentiary, analytic, and programmatic predicate for the feasibility of the reparations for black Americans. Right? Okay? In other words, what would happen if we took what we had, look what we've done, as precedent? Okay? So, what other questions do you have? What kind of money are you talking about? Mm -hmm. ah, I love it. So I, we say that for the very end, right? So um, uh, William Garrett is the editor of this uh, journal, in the Economist, Labor Economist at Duke. Uh, it's really talked about the racial wealth gap as a proxy for the harms, right? Uh, to the tune of $14 trillion. Right? And so we knew just about way of that. I'm a lawyer, so sometimes it's hard for me to visualize that, that, that amount of money, right? But if you took a trillion dollars as dollar bills and stacked them up uh, from the ground, they would extend uh, out, way out into the atmosphere, into space. That's the kind of money we're talking about, okay? Now, here's what I want you to just take note of. You remember that chart of all those programs? When you look at the federal programs that we use today, I'm not talking about anything we create. The programs we use today in terms of repertory compensation literally I represent millions, billions, even trillions of dollars. Right now, in terms of what we do. So we look at how we respond to natural disasters, literally billions of dollars. Um, service members. Now the question you might ask, I would ask about you, is are those Beneficiaries, the same uh, ostensible supposed beneficiaries of racial justice, of racial harm reparations, are they comparable to someone who lost their house in a hurricane or Christmas tree fall? And what I want to suggest to you is obviously, I think so, but the reason why I think we as a country have difficulty answering that question is because we haven't had the conversation. We have not studied the issue, I mean study, I don't mean here at the University of Michigan, but across the country. So when we look at other instances where we uh, had uh, extended reparations, uh, Japanese Americans in turn incarcerated during World War II on the wrong way. That was their second attempt at reparations. And it happened when the country began to have a conversation about what was done to Japanese Americans. We've seen that in terms of Native Americans. We've seen that in terms of people who were irradiated um, by the, and bombed by our government. So my point to you is, it's both a numbers response, how much, but it's also a how response in terms of who and how do we have that conversation. And we need both, right? Is that responsive? Part of it. Part of it, okay. I need something list, realistic. So here's what I mean. Where are you in this whole yeah. thing? Here's what I would do. We can afford and we can do what has already been done for the people who need it done, right? So uh, as was suggested, let me give you a concrete example. When you're all across the South, land was straight out stolen, just stolen, right? Uh, and I'm not talking about subterfuge, I'm talking about through violence. Uh, we, we, we have this documented as a matter of history. Um, there are receipts, but those harms have not been addressed. And so the issue then becomes, do we do something about it? Can we afford to do something about it? 
are we able to do something about it? What our research shows, in answer to all three, is yes. The issue becomes if we're willing to do it. And if we're willing to do it, has everything to do with us starting with, can we talk about the facts? Can we talk about this? Can we talk about that? Now? I want to follow up on that question, and thank you also for this really engaging and interesting uh, talk and conversation. An example that you haven't talked about, and maybe you couldn't add it uh, to the paper, which is uh, crime victim compensation. Uh, in fact, in some states, it's called crime victim reparations, using the exact word. So every state in the country will compensate uh, an innocent victim of a crime for their out-of-pocket expenses associated with that crime. Um, and um, so I spent a few, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, this is like a leading question because I spent like several years studying it, I'm writing a book about it right now. Um, but on the question of how much is this going to cost in the budget, when it came to that particular case, that was sort of the top level question. But the actual question that um, informed the political debate about getting those laws passing and now compensating any innocent victim across the country was not how much, but who would pay. Um, and in the case of crime victim compensation, those debates unfolded in the 60s and 70s primarily, and the answer ended up being not the innocent taxpayer, all of us, um, but quote unquote criminals. Uh, and so the solution of financing that reparations program, which again still exists everywhere, um, is not general public funds, uh, but mandatory criminal fines. It um, uh, traffics in the logic of restitution, but it is quite literally not restitution because it is asking everyone, no matter what the crime that you committed was, to pay into this fund that compensates uh, innocent crime victims. So the question then from that, sorry for the long preamble, um, is not so much about you know, the political will of sort of paying or even convincing us, which I think many of us, at least in this room, are probably convinced that there was harms, you know, no need to sort of convince us on that point. But I'm curious if you thought about this political question of when it actually comes to brass tacks of getting it done, not so much like the dollar amount, but then what happens when it's like, okay, what is the financing mechanism and what can happen? And, and I use the case of crime victim compensation as an, ex as an exemplar in this regard, um, because the answer wasn't really great. While like the reparations do exist now, um, it is being funded by this racially regressive redistribution system that is taking money predominantly from people of color, and now these programs that are reliant on fines to persist need more people locked up, need more people fined uh, to, in order to be paying out uh, um, this sort of reparations. So the question is basically not so much about how much it's cost, but who would pay and how you thought about that and warding off against potentially some of these regressive ways of funding such a program. Thanks. So e excellent point. So we have thought about it. Book as well. So we we uh, we have thought about it and, and included in the paper um, the use of these restitution funds. And but the analogy we use is with, with vaccines. Right? So in other words, in, in a criminal context, we, we essentially impose a fine on everyone who's committed any kind of offense, no matter what the offense is, and, and they all kind of put into a common pot from which they can sort of uh, compensate. But if we look at the vaccine context, right? We impose essentially like an excise tax, if you will, on these vaccines, and we use the money from that where we have children who are harmed by a vaccine, they're compensated that way. So in the context of housing, one could think of an excise tax on loans, but look at where those loans are made. So in other words, where if there are communities where uh, there's been redlining, uh, massive housing discrimination, massive devaluation of uh, the prime driver of intergenerational wealth, you could conceive of a, a scheme that says, we use an excise tax here that's great, greater uh, in order to compensate and not only restore individuals, but restore communities. So there are mechanisms, we, we've thought about that, um, but again, when we look at all these federal programs, what you see over and over again is a variety of funding mechanisms. And we were trying to make the broad point is it's not always about robbing Peter, uh, um, to use a, a, a racial and biblical metaphor here, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul or robbing a white Peter to pay a black Paul, right? Uh, but it can be a matter of how do we uh, impose excise taxes, fees in an equitable way, in a non-punitive way 
to achieve a just result. You mentioned a number of those programs, uh, like the Social Security Administration, um, that were instituted in a way that were either specifically racist or operated in a racist way. I just want to call attention to the USDA being a historically deeply racist organization within our government. And in the late 90s, they paid the largest settlement in US history to black farmers. And I forget the number of black farmers who received it, but they got something like $60,000 each. Um, incidentally, you called me out as being a hypothetical farmer. I was a farmer for eight years. And so I know that for most farmers, $60,000 is like not very much money, even in the 90s, right? And so, uh, and there's a really phenomenal uh, code switch, I think it's a two-part episode about a farmer uh, growing sugarcane, I think in Louisiana, who loses his property because the USDA systematically excludes him from favorable turns on, on loans. And um, so it's still happening. So like, I guess my question is, knowing that some of the very organizations that are, and I would say that the, the, the farm bill is like reparations year in and year out, like for farmers, right? Like when Trump declared the trade war, the farmers got $18 billion, right? And so how do you turn that ship that would in some ways be necessary to compensate black farmers who continue to suffer terrible discrimination? How do you get that kind of systemically racist organization to get on board with this? So part of it is a couple of people recognize the ways in which the government is punishing people who already been punished. I mean, that's obvious. The less obvious point here is helping people understand the ways in which they're being punished by somebody who's not being punished. Right? So in other words, those black farmers, to the extent that they are being punished by farmers, don't suffer the same, but there are economic consequences. And certainly there are economic benefits for black racial harms being addressed for white communities. So for example, look across the country and we look at those counties with the highest slave ownership rates, going all the way back to the, the days of slavery. Those are the same places with the least investment in infrastructure, the same places with the worst investment in the schools, the same place with places which suffer from multi-generational poverty up across the board for everybody. So part of our challenge here is getting people out of this mindset that if it helps them, it must hurt me, as opposed to if it helps somebody else, it could help me. Like we compensate farmers, and I think you as a farmer would admit this, um, you know, farm, farming's not a, a, a wealthy profession for the people who actually do it, right? But these, the subsidies to the corporate farmers and everybody else gets a trickle down, right? It does help the country, right? We're not depending on somebody else for our bread, bread basket. Part of it is making a broader argument, a universalist argument without ducking the racial specificity that's necessary. Like we cannot get away from the fact that, listen, I mean, here's the thing. Um, the, the Christmas tree farmers, great. But when you have like literally generations of black children who literally um, were treated like slave labor for you know well over 100 years, that's a history we got to deal with. But deal with it in a way that essentially says, again, to white middle America, this is something we can do, should do, and would be beneficial to do. And, and again, I go back to if Edmund if a segregationist understood that there might be some benefit to white people from doing the right thing, even if it may help the black people, there might be a list, there might be a 2023 lesson in that. I think we'll draw to a close there. We're running low on time. Let's thank Reverend Dr. Bush.